know you are ready to be married? Or rather, when will I know that I'm ready to be married? Which is the question that I got today on the live that we had. It was very productive. And I answer that question then on the spot. And I've had the evening to think it over. It's been marinating in my brain because it's a very good question. It's actually very profound and wise from a young person. <laughs> very young person actually asked that. And I thought, how smart. And so I've deli- I've thought about it some more and I'm going to answer. And it's the same answer, but I'm just going to go into a little bit more depth. So here are a few ways to know that you might be ready to be married. And how do we know things? So the interesting thing about something like marriage or human relationships is Usually we learn these things in one of two ways, through our own experience or through the experience of others or our own observation or through the observations of others. Okay, so those of you been coming here for a long time now, I have an endless stash of books on human psychology, relationships and all that stuff and my own observations, my own opinions. So anyways, welcome to A Place for Learning. It's Guru Grit. My name is Monica and I've got my list here and I'm excited to get into this a little bit more. So without further ado, no one likes long-winded introductions. No, I certainly don't anyways. So number one, I would say, jokingly, someone in the chat said, oh, you wait for your Saturn return. I said, yeah, sure. Astrologically, you want to be an adult. So what does it mean to be an adult? Okay, so astrologically, it's to have your first Saturn return, which means you're 29 to 30, 31 years old. But in truth, it's to consider yourself an adult. So there's something that I find really fascinating in the society that obviously I'm filming this in where I live, which is in the West, where everyone's like, oh, you're 18, you're an adult. Not true, necessarily. You're legally an adult, but it doesn't mean that every 18-year-old is the same level of maturity, social intelligence, emotional awareness, you know, book smart, anything, okay? You're just legally, it's permissible for you to do certain things, okay? Vote or whatever. So start university and such, okay? But adulthood, you have to define for yourself. When do you really feel capable of functioning in the world autonomously or to the best of your ability as independently as you can, okay? Not everybody will function optimally all the time, but to the best of your ability, what is that for you? So the first thing I would assess then is your level of maturity, which is a little bit funny thing to say because most people are going to say, I'm very mature, but you know, so there's ways to figure this out. So the first thing I said was, you have to have no shame in feeling seen. And I know that sounds very like it's neither here nor there. You need a house. You need a hundred thousand dollars. You need to afford a wedding. I don't care about the wedding. I'm, a wedding is one date. That means nothing to me. Go down to the courthouse, do it for a hundred dollars. Okay. I'm saying a marriage, something that you contract into for an entire lifetime. So what do you need to feel no knee-jerk reaction to basic things. And the example that I gave, which obviously went over someone's head or a couple people's heads in the chat, was something to the effect of like feeling embarrassment or things you can't help. Like if you're giving birth, it is what it is. Like how do you think we all got to be here? We pass through a woman, okay? If you're sick, there's no shame in that. Thank God there's someone there to look out for you. But now is not the time to be like, you can't see me like this. Like, you know, like the 90s rom-com, like the incessant brainwashing of like everything about women being shameful, even body hair. You just, you're allowed two wisps for eyebrows and maybe a little like up here, okay, (laughs) on the actual head. Everything needs to be there. That's insane. We're mammals, we're human. Who even cares, right? So things like this, like you can't be like, oh, I can't, um, I can't have a dinner date with my husband of 16 years because I didn't shave past my ankles. Like after 16 years, I mean, after, I'm sorry, after 16 minutes, I don't even care. Why? You need that level of maturity to know that you're a sovereign human being. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by our creator. You have nothing to feel shamed about if you cannot help it, right? You can help your manners. You can help your intellect. You can read books. You can elevate yourself. You can cultivate yourself. You could be more cultured or well-traveled. But I mean, basic stuff like that, you know, people freak out like, oh, I burped really loud. It was so embarrassing. You didn't mean to. And it was in the privacy of your own home. You shouldn't feel shame for that. You know, if you snore, you know, like do something, get those like patches. But I mean, basically, I think we live in, in a time and a society where people just cannot help themselves. They really can't help themselves. And it's not even their fault. They've been so propagandized to think that something is so wrong with them, that there's always something to inject, some protein powder to try. They need to be bigger, muscles, leaner, thinner, thicker here, thinner there. I mean, it never ends. This is, this is senseless. Okay. This makes no sense. It's a sick psyche. So you have to 
find a way to be at peace with your own self, okay? And that's obviously going to be a level of confidence and um, be comfortable with who you are. Just like really basic things. And I know a lot of times people think that's so obvious, Monica. Like, obviously, it's not obvious. It's not obvious because I see people get into arguments and break relationships over the silliest stuff, you know, like just because they're super, super immature, you know, and they don't, they're not comfortable in their own skin. So they can't be comfortable with anyone else, right? So that's the first thing is just that level of exposure. And I don't mean just physical things, like things like, um, you know, if, if one, per, like I've, speaking from experience, you know, I've seen in my own life, someone's like, you come from a happy, stable home. And I'm too ashamed that I came from a broken home. So they have this like barrier and guardedness all the time. And it's like, I'm just trying to get to know you. I'm trying to like love you. And you make it hard for me because you have set up this barrier because you have this self-perception that you were defective when in fact you're not. And if you feel that you are, do something about it, okay? So that letting people really see you for who you truly are, see yourself as you are, see yourself as a creation of God, and that you were not made wrong. There's nothing wrong with you, okay? Life has its way with all of us, but we can overcome those things and then they make us better for it, okay? That's the first thing. So rid yourself of that and we all feel shame. And, and um, I've done videos on this on Patreon and such, but shame has a lot of purpose. Shame is not a useless feeling. It can help and serve as a moral compass and, and help you show your level of growth as a human being. So don't, you know, like if you went to prison, it's not, it's who you were then. Hopefully it's not who you are now. If it's not who you are now, then you've learned from it. You've become a better man or woman, right? So if, if you were ill and you couldn't work, you needed to go to, you know, some rehab for mobility, well, you were injured then, you are better now. Thank God, like your health is restored. You know, there's lots to celebrate. So why carry shame for things like that life just happens it can happen to anybody <laughs> it's a bit weird like this and random so I think we should all collectively shed that sort of panic of being perfect which is fit to us by people who aren't even perfect as we know that famous quote it's like the girl in the magazine cover doesn't even look like the girl in the magazine cover so you know everybody's breath smells in the morning everybody sneezes I sneeze really loud I'm not like a t like, I don't do that. I'm like, nah, like I'm Balkan. I sneeze loud. It's what I am. You know, I'm not a very dainty woman. So what? Like I'm for somebody. Okay. Cause I'm for myself. That's the way that it is. Okay. So that's the first one, just like in a quick nutshell, but it has a lot to do with maturity and accepting self-acceptance. And this is the thing. This is why it's important. The more you can accept yourself, the more broad and vast your bandwidth is for accepting other people. That is true, like truly to be relatable, to be approachable, to be accepting. So if you can say, you know, maybe you went to university and dropped out after a year because you found it difficult or you had mental health problems or you had issues with affordability and you meet someone that went to an Ivy League school, which makes no sense to me. There's no prestige to education. It's just means to an end. Like it's just, one education is probably just as good as another, maybe, but I don't know. Anyway, that's a whole other topic. And just say, wow, I admire that in you, you know, or, or that your life circumstances, you know, helped you in that way. I'm happy for you. I'm going to get back on the horse and try again. I feel no shame because the person that you fell in love with is a person who didn't get that degree, but they learned all these other things. And so it's not too late. I'm going to go and do that for myself. Okay. Another, so knowing yourself is very important and dropping these, um, ex external definitions that you need because it breeds guardedness, which then is really difficult because then it's really difficult for people to love you. So you can be wed to them but, you know, there's no true intimacy because you're so afraid of being seen, you know, and saying the wrong thing or being misunderstood. This, these things make people very lonely and it breeds resentment. So less defensiveness, but more expectation of yourself and others. Okay. Values. Okay. Most people marry for love. And so I remember getting into a little bit of a, I'll, I'll say an exchange with a former partner who is trying to say that basically um, the Eastern part of the world is like really oppressive and sort of backwards because of the emphasis on marriage and maybe like arranged marriage and things like this. And I said to him, well, in fairness, he hadn't really been anywhere done much. So I was like, okay, but I grew up, I grew up in that part of the world. So I was like, what? So I said, it's wonderful over there. So I said, okay, well, think about it like this. Um, why are the divorce rates so high in the West? 
you know? And he said, oh, I don't know, you know, it's just like hard times are really hard. I said, no, no, tell me, because if, if the Western part of the world is so right about everything and so superior culturally and everything, you know, um, why are the divorce rates so high over here? So by my estimation, it's simple, right? He says, people marry for love, so that can't be it. I said, that's exactly it, because people marry for love but that's not enough. And he said, what do you mean? And he got really offended. Like, oh, you don't love me? He says, this is what I'm talking about, that guardedness. It's not good for you. I said, you can't marry for love when you don't know what love is. Most people don't know what love is. They have an idea. They've seen it in movies. They've seen a lot of Disney films, you know. Um, they don't see it in the mirror. I don't see it in their journals. I don't see it in their thought process. I don't see it in their behavior. It's unintelligent behavior. So I said to him, it can't be for love. Because if it was for love, they'd be married. But you can't give something you don't have. If you don't love yourself, you can't love that person. And then you get two unloving people duking it out for their sanity, okay? Most people split to survive. Their consciousness can't take it. Their psyche can't take it. And for anyone who takes that lightly, you have to understand divorce is a highly traumatic process to a human being. It's actually traumatic. It's like you're being split. It's very painful. I've had a friend of mine in grad school explain this to me. And she says, like, I literally, like, didn't know who I was. Like I had to learn to like eat and walk and talk all over again. It's not something you do lightly. Okay. You do because you feel you have to do it. So values, why are you getting married? So don't tell me you're getting married because you love that person. Cause you might not love them tomorrow. You need a lot of things in common. This is where things like culture really help. So marriage has value. I should have started with that. I believe we are better together. I think life is easier when you're partnered. I know a lot of people say like, well, it's easier for men. It's not easier for women. There's a lot of statistics around that. I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing with you, but you have to choose the best thing for yourself. So I'm saying if you want to be married, because this is the thing I'm getting now, a lot of women are coming to me, asking me questions, getting readings, saying, I really want to get married, but I can't find the right person. Well, this is a funny thing to me as well. It's, it's a matter of values and marrying for love. Most people are illiterate when it comes to relationships, both sexes, okay? Women are obviously far ahead, but marrying for love to me is like, what's that got to do with anything? I don't understand. Most people don't love themselves. And if you marry that person because they love you now, I don't know how they're going to feel tomorrow or a year from now. So it's not enough. You need shared values. Usually you'll find this in things like cultural circles or religious circles, and I've ha I said this in a previous video. I had a, a co-worker who was married really young. They were only 18. And they they said they were going home to celebrate their wedding anniversary. It's like seven years. And I said, seven years? You're 25. Surely you mean your second, your second wedding anniversary. And she went, no, seven years. And she was like, kind of looked at me like I was slow. She's like, I'm Orthodox Jewish. And I was like, so? But you got married so young, you know? And she said, basically, her courtship was very short. And what she did was, she says, I didn't know what to do. Like, technically, I was like 17 turning 18. And then I was 18. And he said, you know, I, I want to be a husband. So if you don't, if you don't tell me soon, I'm not going to like, you know, I'm going to rescind my offer, basically. So she said, well, I didn't know because I don't have the experience. But you know who did? My parents and my elders. So she called people from her religious community. She called in her aunties, her uncles, her grandparents, her parents. Then she called his side of the family, not just the parents. She called them all in. They had a tribunal. She said, come here. Come here. I want to know about this person. What's your idea of a good life? What's your idea of happiness? What are your expectations? Do you want to know my expectations? This is what I think. This is how, and she says, I didn't have the experience. So I defaulted to people that did. So that can be very helpful. Religious values, cultural values, whatever's important to you. You know, they say things like uh, couples that play together, stay together. You know, if you have a sense of adventure, you know, what does that look like to you? So for, for my own life, my parents are very worldly. So when they had children, they didn't stop seeing the world. They just took us with them right? That's the thing. That's the shared value, right? Um, whether it's whatever, faith or secularism, I don't know, whatever you like, you don't like my parents don't drink, they don't smoke. Okay. I didn't have that in my house growing up. That's a shared value. And that's, you pass that on to your children. So think beyond love because another thing I think people get married because they like the feeling of being in love and they say things like, well, you really have to know the other person. I disagree with this. You have to know their value system because they can change who they are. And over 20, 30, 40, 50 years, they're going to be a very different person from the person that you married decades prior, right? And then another reason I'm not in favor is because I think that the longer you're together, the less likely you are to actually get married. I've seen this over and over again. I don't think long courtships bear fruit. I don't think that makes any sense. Um, that's just my opinion. So they'll say you have to know them very well. 
Um, you have the rest of your life to get to know them and they're always changing just as you're always changing, but God willing, God willing, their values stay in place. Okay. You can only hope that that stays. So then the third thing is going to be anger. Now, I'm a different sort of person. I think that fighting is unhealthy. People say things like everybody fights. It's normal. It's not normal. You, you, you claim to love me more than anyone else in the world. You claim to respect me. You have no right having outbursts at me. You don't get to raise your voice to me. You don't get to call me outside my name. You don't get to throw things at me, put your hands on me, vice versa. None of that. Curse even when you're like, don't ever think about it. And it's not allowed. So people say, then how do you resolve conflict? Well, first of all, why is there conflict? That's my question. Because if my opinion is respected, and you care about what I think, you should be glad I gave you my opinion, vice versa. But let's say there is conflict. So I, I even said in the live, how many of you have fought with me? Think about it like this. You can disagree. You don't have to argue. It doesn't have to become an explosive argument. You can have disagreements. You can say, you know, I understand. I don't agree with you. I think our children should, you should drive them to school until they're middle school. It'll make me feel better. I don't want them taking the bus. The person's like, well, they should walk or take the bus. Well, I disagree. I'm worried about their safety and this is why. And then, you know, you just talk like civilized human beings. But why is anger and conflict so important? Because it's inevitable for the most part, okay? You're going to disagree at some point. So what do you do? I say you find a different anger styles. Two hotheads are do not a good matchmake, okay? I turn cold when I'm angry. I freeze over and I can't speak. And so I get so angry, I start to tear up when I'm like really furious, but I won't talk because I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth and it's probably regrettable. It's in the heat of the moment. So I need a person who, like I have like a white heat, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> so they need to be more temperate or cooler or more level-headed, like very type A, you know, or they need to be warm. So they can't be cold. I'm cold. They need to be on the warm side or they need to be on the extremely freezing side over there. You know? So you need to know how to get one, one, one another out of each other's shell and get the ball rolling and communicate. Okay, You both have to be diplomatic in your own way. You can't always be the person apologizing, etc. And that will truly come from a lot of experience. I did meet a lady that married um, in her late 30s and she was very happily married and she married very quickly. They met in November. They were pregnant in May and married in August. And by the time I met her, she was she already had her second child on the way. Okay. And she said, I'm really fiery. She's like, I'm an Aries. Like, I'm hard-headed. There's just a lot of friction, especially the older you are when you meet people later in life. There's just more friction. It's like a clash because you're set in your ways. They're set in their ways. You're just merging worlds that are already established. They're not as malleable. There's not a moldable. They're just not. So you need a lot of like patience and understanding and compassion that you're, it's a big ask for the both of you, right? And she said, but he's really chill. Like he will still disagree with me, but he can like, you know, say something. It just makes me laugh and it like changes the atmosphere. You know, it's not going to ruin the day. So you need someone who gets angry differently than you. Like if you're hot, you need water or someone that pours water over it. You know, if you're dry, you need someone to kind of you know, lighten you up a bit. Okay. So you need to understand those temperaments. Okay. And of course there's always things you can do to like read and help that along. But for the most part, you know, that's how it goes. So another thing too is, um, I did mention maturity earlier and the reasons we marry. So if you kind of combine them, it's to look at your life, say you're 28 or 23 or 39 or 45 you still statistically have decades and decades and decades to live. So beyond just that person, when I say values, what kind of life do you want? And I can give you an excerpt from my own life years and years ago. It was St. Patrick's Day, which doesn't mean anything to me in particular, but I was like, okay, well, whatever, let's, whatever you want to do. And my partner at the time was like, well, I want to go to a pub uh, for a couple of drinks. I was like, okay, whatever. But we went early in the morning. It was like 11 or something. Okay. And there was like some sports games. So fine, whatever. And then I remember as the day just went on, it was just so cold and rainy. And obviously it was like, a, I think it landed on a weekend or something, but I had so much to do. Like I had so much to read. I had like two jobs. One was unpaid. And I was like, oh my God, like I'm so tired. I'm a grad student. Like, it's not like I just wake up and go to work the next day. Like I have to cook, I have to clean, I have to do all, you know, like it was just weighing on me, like deadlines and all this stuff. And I was like, how long are we going to like stay for? And it turned into like a, a 12 hour, we didn't get back to like midnight. It was like a 12 hour binge session. And I was like tired, you're uncomfortable, your toes are cold, you know? And I was like, oh my God. And I just remember thinking to myself throughout that day, 
I don't want this for myself. Like, I don't care if you're a party person, you know, I don't care if that's your idea of fun. Good for you. Nothing wrong with it. That's not who I am. Like, I want to be curled up by a fire on a day like this, reading next to my partner who's also got their nose in a book and we can talk about it and make a cozy meal and nourish each other. I don't find that company nourishing. You're all drunk and belligerent. And every five minutes, this couple's outside shouting, this one's throwing a shoe at her boyfriend. That one's accusing that one of cheating or making eyes at whoever. I don't want this. This is like, I didn't do this in high school. I'm not doing it now. My thirties, I'm 24. This is insane. You're right. So I was just like, you know, I don't really want this for myself. Nothing wrong with it. It's not for me. <laughs> That's it. That's just how it goes. You know what I mean? So when you look look at your life, you know, for me, I can't imagine doing that for fun. I did that out of love once. I'll never do it again. I'm never doing that again. Do I want my children there? No. You know, what? what it, it doesn't nourish me. It's not exciting. It's not mentally stimulating. I didn't, and my big thing is I didn't learn anything. I didn't learn anything. So I'm out of place. Everybody knows it. I know it. What am I doing, right? So life goes on. So understand, you know, what do you want your life to look like? Do you take a yearly vacation? Do you prioritize well-being? Do you go for a monthly, you know, um, hike through the woods? Do you go for a massage? Does your partner drink enough water? Do they know how to care for themselves? Do you care for yourself? What type of relationship do you want? What are your values, right? And that's another one too is cooperation. This also falls under values as well and what you want your life to look like. Are you with a cooperative person? So this is one, you know, oftentimes you'll find things like, I see this all the time on TikTok, right? Usually it's the woman, but it can also be men. They'll say things like, I'm holding it down while my husband's in medical school. That's totally different to where I'm sitting in this stage of my life. So this won't apply to maybe to half the people, but I'm past that stage. I'm not with someone who's in a stage of building. I've built I'm done. I'm put down my shovel and my helmet and my steel toe boots. That's over for me. Right. So someone comes into my life and they're still doing that. I, you're not for me. God bless you. Wish you all the best. Vice versa. You don't even want me anyway. Right. So you have to understand what you want your life to look like. So I'm not holding anything down for anyone. We're both finished at this stage. Okay. So what are we looking towards together? Okay. So that's the thing. So you have to understand what you actually want for yourself and what you're comfortable with. If you're not comfortable with that, so say so. So nothing's wrong with you, but I'm not comfortable paying these bills for another five years, four years, then you do residency for five years. Sorry, can't do it. Can't afford it. You could screw me in the end. I'm not, I don't know. I don't know. It's just not for me. I'm over it. I did my bit. I'm happy, whatever. If you're happy to do it, do it. But you know, so understand what you want your life to look like. Okay. Um, if, you, if you're ambitious, like I'm pretty goal oriented, I would say. I'm always busy. I'm always productive. I like people who are like that. I like getting together at the end of the day, talking to them. Okay. So the idea of your ideal relationship should also have these more nuanced things. I think oftentimes people think of like, we're going to honeymoon in the Maldives, that place that floats on the water. That's like whatever, $10,000 a night. You know, we're going to drive nice cars and do yoga and, um, you know, whatever. But think of the day to day. Do you have, do you touch base? Is there pillow talk? Is this person very communicative? Are you communicative? Is that important to you? You know, how do you communicate? Um, uh, Are you both uh, even tempered, open tempered? You know, is one gregarious and one is shy? Like what, you know, your day to day life, what does that look like? So like I'm family oriented. There's no question when I get married, that's my family too now. We're, we're equal. If he cannot treat my family just as well or better than his own, I have no business being married to that person. Because you're not getting the better end of the deal as far as I'm concerned. Because I know you'll be welcome with open arms and open hearts, right? Because that's an important thing. You have to understand long term down the line, what does that look like? You know, if I'm, I'm a very flexible person. But the things that I hold dear, which is very small, like in terms of relationships, I'm not willing to part with. That's it. Like my culture, my language, my heritage is so important to me. If you love me, you will learn them. And you will do it happily and gladly. You won't question it, right? There's To me, there's no greater form of love than when a man appreciates his woman's culture. It's a wonderful thing. And why wouldn't you? It makes you a better person, right? You, you learn more about the world. So that I'm not compromising on. Okay, so that's one example, right? Like, you know what your life looks like. My children speak my language. They eat the food I grew up eating. They go to the places I went to as a child. No question about it. If someone thinks that they're, it's, in, it's inferior to them and the way they grew up, we have no business speaking to each other. So keep, keep that in mind, okay? Um, and again, it's little things, right? 
Do they serve you coffee without you asking? If you're cold, do they put a blanket on you? Are they considerate? If you could boil down relationships to two words, as I always say, is consider others. Do they consider others? All right. And this is the last two points. Number one, this is so important. This is more important. I don't know which is more important. They're both important. This is like second to last, I'll say. You have to marry someone if you want to be married who actually wants to be married. I'll say that again. They have to want to be married. So much of the time when things go wrong, people say, I don't know what happened. They were so into me. We were planning this dream life and they, they swore up and down they love me. They might love you. You might be the love of their life. They're just maybe not in love with the idea of matrimony and building a life and doing all that mundane stuff like shoveling snow, you know, and lawn fertilizer in the spring and whatever, okay? You, first and foremost, if you actually want to get married, anyone who does not expressly want to be married, do not waste your time. You're not going to convince them. And if you do, I fear for you. I'm fearful of the longevity of that bond. Okay. That's, that's the silliest thing to me. You know, if, if you, again, if you apply that, take that relationship formula, apply it to anything else. Like if you go to a job interview and they ask you, where do you see yourself in five years? They want to know if you're going to be with the company. If you said, oh, I hate working, but if you give me money, I'll think about it. So when you're on an app and it says, looking for casual fun. Do not swipe right and then attempt to change that person from the inside out. That's not your job. You're wasting your own time. Just cut cut them loose and go free yourself, okay? So you have to marry someone who wants to be married, okay? And then another thing I want to add is do not think that marrying somebody who doesn't have what you want will be provided for you somewhere down the line either. Do not delude yourself. You have to obviously have some emotion or footing with that person. So you want them to love you. But if they don't love themselves, they can't give you what they don't have. If they're not commitment oriented and you want a commitment, what are you doing? If you want love, but they don't have it to give, what are you doing? So this is my last point. It's exactly this L word that's so controversial, though, ironically on this cup. (laughs) Skinny love, though. So maybe it's Ozempic love. (laughs) And this is a really important thing to look out for. And this goes out to men and women. I honestly can't even be biased because I see that both genders do this. Most people who talk about getting into a relationship, getting engaged, being in a relationship, being married, being common law, whatever, 90, if not 99%, 90% of people do it to be loved. Does that seem right to you? They do it to get something. They're not doing it to be loving. And that energy repels the best people. It repels the best people because it's not, it's not generous at its core. And when you're in a functioning adult relationship, you need to be generous. You need to be generous whether you feel like it or not. Okay. If that person's angry, they need space as much as you want to scream or tell them something, let them have their moment. Let them calm down. You know, you have to have grace. You have to have compassion. You have to have understanding. You have to give of yourself on every level. Okay. Okay. So if you are only looking to take, you're going to exhaust each other. You're going to be drained by that loser and you're going to resent and hate one another before you even know it. So you, if you want to get married, this is my biggest tip to you. Look at what you can give rather than what you can get because there's no promise in that. You actually don't know what that person's going to do for you, deliver unto you. When the time comes, they might switch up. You don't know. But the only thing you really know is you should know is yourself that you can be consistent, you can be relied upon, you can be considerate, you can be righteous, you can be faithful, you can do right, okay? So if someone decides to make a fool out of you and the life that you live by, you know, dishonoring the vows that you made, you can still be an honorable person and noble and leave and keep your mental health and integrity intact, okay? So don't let someone who's only looking to take from you, but also don't be that person, So be the kind of person you want to be with. And I don't mean that on external things. Some people are like, so if I make 150K, you have to make 150K. You're not even worth 5K. Why would I even talk to you? You know what I mean? You have to look at, okay, if I want a generous person, am I a generous person? Do I listen when people need me? Do I reply? Do I take the time to understand them? You know, that's truly generous, being present. Because time is the greatest resource your energy. Okay. Love is total presence and full attention. Can you do those things? So if you know that you have them to give, 
then I believe you can bank on it, that you will receive it. But that takes a lot of self-reflection. And that's why that last point and that first point go hand in hand. Because if you're too um, guarded for someone to really see into you, then how can you give of yourself when you undervalue yourself? So you should have a healthy sense of self. And I know it's such a, a cop out to be like, just love yourself. No one, everyone says love yourself. No one actually tells you how to do it. They don't really know what it means. But appreciate yourself. Romanticize your life. You're not that bad. What's wrong with you? Who told you that you were, you know? <laughs> just do better. Just do better than you did from the last time that you were um, beating up on yourself. You know, come full circle. Forgive yourself. Forgive those that have hurt you. Don't become like them. That's very counterintuitive. So I hope this helps. Hope that makes sense. So, you know, you want to have someone that got, has different conflict resolution skills and then just coming back to that end point about look at what you have to give look at the love that you have to give more than looking to get love I would say if you're a woman look to be the best version of yourself be the best woman that you can be and if you're a man whether you're married or not is irrelevant especially but if you are in a marriage you should look to be the best man that you can possibly be because spouses reflect one another whether they like to admit it or not you know so if your spouse disappoints you you're going to resent your decision you're going to feel duped but the silver lining is once you're duped in life you can never be duped again because it's such a intensely traumatic learning curve <laughs> so um don't feel despair or despondent love can happen to us all it can happen again and you know what when it does it's so much better what you can do the second time around so it's never too late and i hope that answers the question in full and until next time i love you all and yeah i'll see you on patreon i'm off etsy now i'm going to have my own website though i will keep i have another etsy shop that's really old called brava mocha vintage where i used to sell like vintage stuff so i want to put up stuff to sell because I have too much <laughs> and um yeah I'll see you on Instagram and TikTok and I love you all bye for now